Well, we're almost there. We're approaching rather quickly that time of the year that we set aside to celebrate the most amazing reality that has ever intersected human history. Yahweh, I am leaving greatness and descending into time, space, and matter to show us that he loves us and to make a way back through him. You know, it's historically clear that I am stepped into humanity. Look back in history, you see it. First century Jesus, he's walking with humanity. He enters a wedding, what does he do? He makes water into wine. wine. He's bumping into people in culture, speaks and demons come out of people's lives and they enter back into culture and live a normal life. He sees people that are blind, lame, suffering from disease. He touches them and they're healed. Oh yeah, he walked on water. You can't walk on water. That's impossible. <laughs> Physics says it's not possible, but this is I am. He called the storm that would have sunk all fishing boats and drowned sailors. Oh, yeah, and he even fed 5,000 people with, guess what? Five little barley loaves and two little fish. Who else but Jesus? Huh? I am. That's what Christmas is all about. <coughs> Back then, first century AD, people were tasting and touching and feeling that reality. They didn't really know what was going on. I mean, was it sleight of hand? Was it a magic trick? I mean, how could Jesus do these things? And how could he talk like that? People didn't know. And as these questions began to come up, Jesus began to slowly but surely take the veil away. And he did that very clearly when he spoke these two words. I am. And everybody said, that's what God said. I am. I am has entered time, space, and that. That's what Christmas is all about. That's why we're here. That's why we celebrate Today we're going to go a little bit farther, look a little bit more at how Jesus, in who he is, as he revealed that he is God in the flesh, makes a difference on your Christmas and my Christmas and makes it more vivid. You ready to jump into the Word of God? You have your Bibles? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. Father, again, we thank you for your Word. Speak to us clearly today, Holy Spirit. May everyone here remember the Word of God and not my words. We look forward to going farther and deeper. We pray this in your powerful name and all God's people said. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Take your Bibles, open up to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Again, if you're not familiar with a Bible, you can navigate simply by going to the front and there's a table of contents. Find the Old Testament, the New Testament. Find John in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book. Go ahead and turn there and then remember chapters are big numbers and verses are little numbers. And we're going to start by reading one simple verse this morning. John chapter 10, verse 11. John chapter 10, 
verse 11. If you're there, say amen. 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 If you're not, say please wait for me. Good job. Way to go, Bible students. Listen real closely. These are words that Jesus said. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let that soak in again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, as we unpack this statement, I want us to understand the situation surrounding it. Why would Jesus all of a sudden talk about him, I am Yahweh, being the good shepherd? Well, to catch what's surrounding it, we have to go back to chapter 9. So just turn just a little bit to your left, and we're going to find in chapter 9 an amazing miracle that sent ripples throughout the community, and this frames why Jesus said what he did. Here we go, chapter 9. And as he passed by, as Jesus, he saw a man... Blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming, when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and applied the clay to his eyes. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is translated sent. And so he went away and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and those who previously saw him as a baker were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. I'm the one. Therefore, they were saying to him, how, how then were your eyes open? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Shalom and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. <laughs> Here's the situation. Why these words came up. Why Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. This miracle sent ripples throughout its community. People who saw this guy, they said, hey, he's, isn't that the beggar? And then others said, no, no, he just looks like the beggar. You probably run across times like that when you say, hey, that looks like, oh, no, it's not. That's exactly what was going on. This was an amazing miracle, and the confusion came. Because something like this had never, ever happened before. Never had a blind person who had been born blind from birth miraculously been able to see. So the miracle happens, but things get stirred in this picture because there's a group of people called the Pharisees that enter into the story. Now we know, as we read through the Bible, that whenever the Pharisees get into the picture, there's always this little bit of religious piety. And they think they're so good. Well, as they step into the picture, things begin to get stirred up a little bit. 
by these religious guys. In fact, as they see what's going on, they go, oh, we got a problem. We got a problem. I want us to read what they say the problem is. Take your Bibles, look at chapter 9. We're going to read verses 13 through 16. They brought to the Pharisees him who was formerly blind. Now, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Again, therefore, the Pharisees also were asking him how he received his sight. He said to them, he applied clay to my eyes. I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. I mean, you would think, wouldn't you think, that if there's a man who was blind from birth, and all of a sudden he goes, I can see that everybody would be happy. They'd be going, wow, this is great. This guy has never been able to see before. Now he can. You'd think that everybody would be going, wrong. But not these religious leaders. They had to throw around their religious piety a little bit. And they looked at the situation and said, we got a problem here. We're not going to be happy for this guy because you know what? He was healed on the Sabbath. And nobody should be able to be healed on the Sabbath. In fact, the guy who did it, he was probably filled with a demon. What's going on with these guys? They are crazy. That's what happens when you get a little bit too religious, huh? You start thinking that you're pretty hot. That you know all the answers. But instead, foolishness was part of the picture. He can see. Be excited about it. Another problem came up because the guy who could see, he kept going around going, the guy who healed me must be from God. Jesus, he's from God. Well, the religious leaders didn't like that. Because they said he was filled with what? A demon. Can't go against us. What we say. And so you know what they did with the blind men? They booted him out of the synagogue. They said, you know what? If you're not going to believe what we say, if you're not going to go along with what I say, we're going to cancel your account. We're going to stop the truth from being told. We're going to kick you out of church. We're going to stop you because we hate truth. You must believe what we say. So we got a problem. Jesus does this miracle. The guy's excited. It's on a Sabbath. He gives praise to God, praise to Jesus. And the world says, no, we do not want this truth to be told. But the guy, he couldn't stop it. The Bible says he just kept going around. People said, hey, can you see? He goes, yeah. Who, who did it? Jesus. What do you know? He goes, I don't know. All I know is I was blind. But now I can what? See. see. Can you imagine what that would be like if you had a neighbor or a friend who you had known Growing up was blind. They walked around with the cane. Growing up in school, they had to use Braille, everything. 40 years old, they come over to your house and they go, Hey, last night, my eyes opened up. I could see. You go, No, that's impossible. See, people couldn't comprehend it. How could that be? That somebody like that, somebody that you knew, could actually see. And he said, I don't know either, but I can tell you, Jesus, he did it. Jesus did it. That's how this phrase, I am the good shepherd, is framed. Jesus, the good shepherd, came to this man who was blind and said, I love you. I have compassion. I care for you. And he opened his eyes, so now he could see for the first time the beautiful creation that he's never seen. And then he could also see the creator. Can you hear that 
in Jesus' word that I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. That's who Jesus is. He's on your side. He loves you. He loves the world. He loves people. That's why he has come. That's what Christmas is about. Put that next to those guys that dress up in little red suits and beards. <laughs> what do they have to offer? Put that next to Santa Claus. <coughs> There's nothing there but Jesus as the good shepherd. He says, I love you. You can see a glimpse into who I am really is, can't you? As he stepped into time, space, and matter, as he infiltrates humanity, bumps elbows, lets people know that there is hope in Jesus. So they can have life, and have life more abundantly. But, let's go just a little bit farther to see even more how Jesus unveils his reality that he is God in the flesh. Go to chapter 11. Chapter 11. I want you to look at verses 25 and 26. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say please wait for me. Chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's a good question, huh? Let's read it one more time. Jesus said to her, I am, ego me, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he what? Dies. Dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. die. Do you believe this? Yes. Good question. Well, Jesus again is taking the veil off, letting people know that he is Yahweh, God in the flesh. He is the source of of life. Do you realize that everything that lives lives because of Jesus? He created everything. Inanimate objects, animate objects. From the smallest little cell to the most complex human being. Jesus is the source of life. Do you realize that? He's the source of life. He is the creator of life, not because he has that power, but because he is life. Life exists in him, in Jesus. And as he made that statement, he said, He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he what? Amen. Yet shall he what? Live. Yet shall he live. Jesus makes a very important point here. Death is not the end of you. Did you hear that? Death is not the end of you. It's not the end of me. Death is a momentary transition into eternity. I talked to a guy yesterday at the gym. Mike, we're talking a little bit, and uh, brought up the subject of Christmas and Jesus, and I said, hey, have you ever heard this verse from the Bible, for God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son? He goes, yeah, I heard that. In fact, I used to teach Sunday school. I go, really? He goes, but I don't believe that. Wow. I don't believe it. I go, well, what happened? He goes, well, I don't think I ever believed it. I go, well, Mike, what happens when you die? He goes, you're just dead. That's it. Your existence is over. You don't even remember that you live. And I said, but Mike, you remember that you 
taught Sunday school and said to God, he goes, yeah, but I don't have that faith. I don't have that faith. When you're dead, you're dead. Jesus says, wait, wait, wait. No, Mike. Mike, Mike. <laughs> death is a momentary transition into eternity. So, I want us to frame that statement that Jesus said also with the situation that it comes in. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at chapter 11 and we're going to read the first few verses of chapter 11. Here we go. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, and it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who, he, him who you love is sick. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God and the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When therefore he heard that he was sick, he stayed them two days longer at the place where he was. Then after this he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not Twelve hours in a day, if someone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And he said, and after that, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of his sleep. The disciples therefore said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death. But they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. Then Jesus therefore said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. So that you may believe. But let us go to him. That's the situation that's surrounding this statement that Jesus makes here. I am the resurrection and the life. Here, he is going to show us that he is the life in this situation with Lazarus. Now, there's a lot of people that have heard about this story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, and there's a lot of people that are skeptical about it. Maybe you know some of them. Skeptical that this could ever happen. They might say, oh, no, this was a trick. This was some kind of sleight of hand. I mean, back there in first century AD, they didn't really know if somebody was really dead. They didn't have an EKG or an EGG to register their brain waves or their heart pattern. So maybe he really wasn't dead. Maybe he was just in this alternate state of consciousness where he could be revived. Well, skeptics, listen up. See, the Bible makes it very clear that that could not be the case for Lazarus. Because you see, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Let that sink in for just a minute. Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now, history tells us this. In first century AD, when someone died in the Jewish culture, here's how they took care of death. They would wrap that person in cloth, and then they would sprinkle spices on them and put them in a tomb. That's how they handled death. They did not do anything 
to take care of decay. Now I want you to think about something. When a person dies, the first thing that happens is their heart stops what? Yeah. Beating. When their heart stops beating, the cells that are in a person's body are then depleted of oxygen. That's the first thing that happens. As those cells are depleted from oxygen, blood drains from throughout the body and starts to gather in pools in some of the lower places of the body. Okay? Muscles, they begin to stiffen with what a Latin term is called, guess what? Rigor mortis. Rigor mortis. That sets in in a body after three hours. 24 hours after a person dies, a human body has lost all of its heat. The muscles begin to loosen up a little bit from rigor mortis after about 36 hours. 72 hours after a person has died, rigor, mor rigor mortis has completely vanished and a body becomes completely soft. Looking a little bit deeper. As the cells in a human body begin to die, bacteria takes over. Bacteria in a human body begins to break down all the cells in a human body. The decomposing tissue then takes on a horrific look. And what begins to happen in a human body after 72 hours is it releases hydrogen sulfide and methane, as well as other gases which produce a horrible smell. That's why when you hear people who have maybe been in war and they come upon a place where people have been dead for a while, they tell you that you can smell the horrible smell of death or earthquakes. When they're searching for people after 72 hours, the stench becomes terrible. Because what begins to happen when it deteriorates in human body, when it dies? And then what science tells us is that the body begins to emit these ugly looking green fluids after 72 hours. You know why I tell you that? Because that's when Jesus came to Lazarus. Four days after he had died. Everyone knows he's dead. Mary and Martha. In fact, when you read this account, when they find out Jesus is coming, guess what? They come up to Jesus and say, Mary, Mark, Mary and Martha say to Jesus, you know what? By now, he stinks. The King James says he stinketh. <laughs> you know why? Because in first century AD, people lived with the reality of death. They lived with that reality. They didn't live in a world like we live in, of sterilized death, where when a person dies, they disappear, they go to the mortuary, they get embalmed, the next time you see them, they're in a casket, and they're dressed up to look like, and made up to look as much like they were when they were alive. That's the world we live in. We have no idea what death is really like. In first century AD, they lived with death. They knew what it looked like. They knew what it smelled like. And so when Jesus comes to Lazarus, Mary and Martha say, Jesus, you can kind of hear it in the back of their mind, it's too late. We know what's happened with Lazarus' body. It's been four days. We've seen that before. That's where Jesus meets Lazarus. 
And the Bible tells us, in fact, as he hears their weeping, the Bible says, that he was moved, grieved within his spirit. That word grieved in the original language has to do with complete sorrow, anger, frustration. Jesus, as he hears about this and sees and senses this, he's grieved in his spirit. Yeah, he's sad. He's lost his good friend Lazarus. He's sad. He loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha. They were some of his best friends. Everybody recognized how much he loved this family. In fact, those that were listening and watching said, Behold, how he loved them. Jesus wept. He wept. Two simple words. The shortest verses in the Bible. Jesus wept. But those two words contain so much more. Can you picture this? Jesus at the tomb. He literally can't hold it in anymore. He's grieved in his spirit. And Jesus begins to sob. He begins to sob out loud. He can't contain the grief. Yes, he's sad. He's sad because he lost his friend Lazarus. He's sad because he knows Mary and Martha have lost their brother. But I think those tears go farther than that because Jesus understands the sadness that's going to go throughout history as all people experience this separation of death that happens because of sin. He sobs. But what happens next is what I want you to grab hold of. It's astounding. Look at verses 43 and 44. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. I am has entered time, space, and matter. I am the resurrection and the life. I am is what Christmas is all about. Jesus said, I've come to give you life. Not just life now, but life forever. He who believes in me, though he were what? Dead, yet shall he live. Santa needs to know that. Because <laughs> it's not about presents, Santa. It's not about you coming down the chimney. It's not about cookies and milk. It's not about Rudolph and reindeer on the roof. It's not about writing a letter to Santa that he sees who's good and who's bad. It's not about Frosty the Snowman. Grinch has nothing to do with this. It's about the resurrection and the life entering time, space, and matter so that you and I, even though we die, yet shall we live. Because he who comes to the bread of life gets nourishment that lasts forever. He who comes to the light of the world has their sin exposed, but yet has an answer. And the answer is Jesus. He 
who comes to the Good Shepherd and finds life and life more abundantly. And he who bows his knee to the resurrection and the life gets life forever. Amen. That's that's the reality of this time of Christmas. That's the good news. When you bump elbows with people, say, hey, is Christmas about Santa Claus or is Christmas about Jesus? Simple question that people will answer you. For those who say it's about Jesus, you say, thank you. Do you love Jesus? Amen. For those who say it's about Santa, you say, I've got some better news than Santa for you. I have news about the resurrection and the life who entered time, space, and matter, who became a baby, who grew up to be a man, who died on the cross and shed his blood so that your sins and my sins should be forgiven. So that one day, when we take our last breath, that momentary transition will take us into eternity. And God says, there's nothing more amazing that you could think of. It's never entered into your heart or mind, but I prepared for everyone who loves me for eternity. Now my guess is that most of us in this room love Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. But I don't know your heart. See, there's a lot of people that go to church on Sundays and Christmas time, and they do it because they're supposed to. Or they do it because their husband goes, or their wife goes, or their friend goes, or their neighbor goes, or their uncle goes, or their aunt goes. Or whoever it is, they go. But they may know the story of Jesus, but they've never bowed their knees. They've never given their life to him. There's a big difference. Big difference. I can know that water is good for me and hydrates me, but if I don't drink it, it's not going to do me any good, is it? I can know that exercise is good, but if I don't do it, not going to make any difference. I can know that Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem. But if I don't believe, if I don't come to the resurrection and life, it won't do me any good. I don't know where you are. If you're here today, you love Jesus. Amen. Say, thank you, Jesus. You're on your way to heaven. But if you're here today and you kind of go, I'm not sure. I mean, I come to church. Look, at I'm here. I'm a nice person. I do good things. That's not going to get you to heaven. What's going to get you to heaven is this. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him, believe that inner kingdom, that would trust him, that would believe on him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. The reason we need Jesus, because the Bible says, For all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room, we're all sinners. You know it. You're a sinner. I know it. Because I look in the mirror. And I know what goes on inside of me. We're all sinners. Because of that sinfulness, God says we can't enter into his presence. So he said, from the beginning, from the Garden of the Eden, Eden, when sin entered the world, God had a plan. He said, I love you. And that plan has to do with the sacrifice. And that sacrifice is Jesus, who died on the cross, shed his blood, and rose again, so that anybody who put their faith and trust in him could have their sins forgiven. So, if you're here and you've never trusted Jesus, maybe today's that day. Today's the day you need to bow your knees, confess your sins, tell God you're sorry, and put faith and trust in him. If you're here and you do love Jesus, then take a deep breath, crawl up on his lap, say, you know what? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He believes in him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I believe that. And I'm on my way to heaven. Awesome? Father, we thank you for our morning today. We thank you for the privilege that we have to have your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for everyone in this room. Everyone here who has put their faith and trust in you, who you've taken their blinders off, 
They do believe in you, the resurrection and the life. They do have that eternal life. Because it's not just something in their head, it's something that's in their inner kingdom. They love you. But Father, we pray if there's anybody here that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus, that today you would open the eyes of their heart, let them see the truth and reality that without Jesus there is no answer. And if you're here today and God's speaking to your heart, just talk to him right now, right where you're sitting. Let him know. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Today, I want you to come into my life, be my Savior, my Redeemer. We're so thankful for the celebration that we put aside in the United States of America, and that happens throughout the world, in many places, a time to remember that you, I am, entered our world of time, space, and matter, so that we might one day enter eternity. We soak that in, we take a deep breath, and your grace and mercy. We love you, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen, you guys. Have a great week. Next Sunday, Christmas Eve, we'll look forward to seeing you. 10.30 in the morning, or 5 o'clock at night. You're dismissed. Enjoy your week. Amen.